Today we are looking at a case from the early 20th century. So sit back as we go to Monaco. Veer St. Ledger Gould was born on the 2nd of October 1853 in the beautiful town of Clonwell in County Tipperary in Ireland. He was raised in the coastal city of Waterford. He came from a relatively aristocratic family. His grandfather was a baronet and his grandmother was a daughter of the Earl of Kenmare. Veer's father was a magistrate in County Waterford, but his mother died when he was 17 years old and this had quite an effect on him. Despite the family's distinguished lineage, they were not considered wealthy, although as a child, Veer's life was not particularly difficult. He received a good education and would spend much of his spare time sailing, hunting and horse riding. When he became a young man, he would often be seen with people who were considered to be from a far more elite social circle. One pastime, which had become popular in Ireland with the upper and upper middle classes, was tennis. In 1877, the Fitzwilliam Lawn Tennis Club was founded, and in 1879, the first Irish tennis championships took place. Veer very much enjoyed the sport and became a very good player. Tennis was a way for him to meet Dublin's high society, and in 1879, when he was 25 years old, he entered the first ever Irish National Tennis Championship. He was very fit and athletic, and was known for his powerful backhand and his great domination of the net. He won the tournament and became the Irish national champion. Following his success, he travelled to England to compete in the Wimbledon Championships. Again, he played well, dropping only two sets on his way to the final. The final was considered a great occasion and took place on the 15th of July in front of a large crowd. There was great anticipation beforehand as both players had been playing well and everyone was looking forward to a close match. Veer, however, lost to the Reverend John Hartley, who was the only vicar ever to have won the Wimbledon Tennis Championship. But he did not just lose. He lost in quite a disappointing manner, three sets to nil. After the defeat, rumours emerged that Veer, who was now a minor celebrity among those who followed tennis, had spent the night before the final drinking in the London pubs and had arrived to the final match suffering from a terrible hangover, which meant that he was unable to perform at a level anywhere near his best. This was also the year that his father died. He returned to Ireland and continued to play tennis. In 1880, he again reached the final of the Irish Tennis Championships, but this time he lost the title to a gentleman named William Renshaw, who later went on to win the Wimbledon Championship seven times. His tennis fame meant that he would be invited to prestigious social events but he began to drink and gamble. This lifestyle soon started to have a detrimental effect on his tennis ambitions, and his promising career ended in 1883, when after some defeats, he decided that it was time to stop playing and instead tried to make a living in London. However, life was much the same for him there. He continued to drink and gamble, and his lifestyle continued on somewhat of a downward spiral. He then by chance met a lady named Marie Giraudin, she owned a dressmaker's shop in the upmarket area of Bayswater. She was younger than Veer, having been born in France in 1860. She was a daughter of an ironmonger and had worked in dressmaking since she was very young. She had a reputation as being very skilled at her trade. One in France she had married. However, her parents had not cared much for her choice of husband. Their concerns were proved correct as just one week after the marriage, he left her feeling ashamed. Marie travelled to Geneva in Switzerland, where she worked in a dressmaker's shop. She later travelled to London, and when she learned that her husband had died, she married a captain in the British Army. But he also died, leaving her a widow for the second time. Although she was an extremely good dressmaker, she was not such a good businesswoman, and her shop was never very successful. Marie and Veer seemed to hit it off. He'd only visited the shop, as he was asked to pay a bill for a relative but Marie paid him particular attention. The handsome gentleman from a minor aristocratic family appealed to her and they started courting. In 1891, Veer St. Ledger Gould and Maria Giraudin were married. They continued to live in London, but their love for the finer things in life soon meant that their finances were in a very poor state. They were behind on their rent and had sold all their furniture. So with few options, they decided to leave the city 
and made their way to Montreal in Canada. This was a new start for them. They would tell people that they were certain Lady Gould. Marie set up a dressmaking shop, and although this was a business she knew well, it seemed that the couple had not learnt anything from their previous experiences, and soon started to live beyond their means. They spent very freely, dining at the more expensive restaurants, and Veer would drink and gamble. They were unable to sustain this way of life for very long, and once again managed to exhaust their creditors. It came as no surprise that Veer announced that he had to leave Montreal for a while to return to Ireland. He said that a family member had died. The couple then spent the next two years between Canada and England before eventually settling in Liverpool, arriving in 1903. Here they set up a laundry business, but continued with the pretense that they were from a high social standing and told anyone that inquired that they should be referred to as Sevilla and Lady Gould. The couple continued to try and live a lifestyle more associated with the aristocracy, but by doing this, they continued to get themselves into debt. They tried to devise a way of making a quick fortune, but nothing seemed to work. Eventually, Marie came up with the idea that they should go to Monaco, as she thought that she may have cracked a system, which would mean that they would be able to win large amounts of money on the Monte Carlo gambling tables. So in the summer of 1907, they set off to the small principality, situated on a prominent escarpment at the base of the Maritime Alps along the French Riviera. They continued to call themselves Severe and Lady Gould. They rented the fourth floor of a spacious villa and mixed with the many high society people who spent the summer in Monaco. They had both always been very good at putting on an act. Vere would tell the many ladies and gentlemen he met that the title had passed on to him when his older brother had died in a tragic horse racing accident. Unsurprisingly, this was not actually true, as his brother, Sir Stephen James Gould, was very much alive, but had dropped the title as he had moved to Australia and worked on the railway, and he did not want his fellow workers to know of his noble background. Many people met Vera Marie in the small principality, but no one seemed to doubt that they were who they said they were, and the couple made sure that they were always courteous, polite and well-dressed. Throughout their stay, they are accompanied by Mrs Gould's niece, a very attractive young lady named Isabel. She would always be seen out with them, and her beauty certainly attracted the attention of young gentlemen, many of whom were very anxious to make her acquaintance. Things, however, were not going well for Mr and Mrs St Ledger Gould. When they had first arrived in Monaco, they had some success on the gambling tables, but as days passed, they started to lose money and now found themselves once again in a very poor financial position. They wondered how they would be able to stay in Monaco and started to see if there may be a wealthy patron who would be able to offer them a loan. Marie had always been quite good at persuading people to lend her money. At her dressmaking shop in Bayswater, she often borrowed money from her wealthy clientele and whilst in Monaco, she had befriended a lady named Emma Levin. Mrs Levin was a very wealthy widow, originally from Denmark, but who now lived in Stockholm. She was not unlike Marie, having had a difficult upbringing. Her father had abandoned the family home when she was young, and life had been hard for her, until she married a very successful Swedish merchant. Mrs Levin was a lively character, who very much enjoyed the atmosphere in the Monte Carlo casinos. She was accompanied by a lady named Madame Castellazzi. Marie, however, managed to charm Mrs Levin, and the two started to spend quite a bit of time in each other's company, much to the displeasure of Madame Castellazzi. Marie always appeared to be an agreeable and caring person, and was able to persuade Mrs Levin into lending her and her husband 1,000 francs. She said that she was waiting for money to be sent from London, but loan was very much needed, as Mr and Mrs Gould had managed to lose all the money they had. With the loan, Veer then returned to the gambling tables but it did not take long for him to lose all the money they had borrowed off Mrs Levin. Madame Castellazzi, however, had never been fond of Marie and paid her little attention. Things between the two ladies came to a head when they had an argument in a casino. This soon became a very talked about incident among Monaco's high society visitors and even appeared in the local press. The incident caused some embarrassment to Mrs Levin and she decided that it would be best if she returned to Sweden. Before she left, however, she was anxious to collect the 1,000 francs that she had lent to certain Lady Gould. 
so on the 4th of August 1907, she went to the couple's rented villa. Five days later, on the 9th of August, the Goulds arrived at Marseille train station on their route back to London. They requested that their large trunk be put in the station storage department while they went to eat at a local hotel. One of the porters noticed that blood was dripping from it. The porter had seen many things since he had started working at the station, but this caused him much concern. He asked a gentleman why blood was coming from the trunk. Mr Gould replied that he was transporting dead chickens. The station staff did not seem to be satisfied with the answer and contacted the police. The police arrived and after a brief conversation with Madame Gould, demanded that the trunk be opened. Inside, they discovered a dismembered female body. In Monaco, Madame Castellazzi had informed the authorities that Mrs Levin was missing. She told them that she had gone to collect a debt from Sir and Lady Gould and had not returned. The police visited the villa that the Goulds had vacated and discovered that Marie's niece Isabel was still in residence. Isabel told the police that her aunt had gone to Marseille as Mr Gould needed to see a doctor there. The police inspected the property. Bloodstains were visible and they came across items but looked very much out of place in a rented holiday villa. There was a saw and a hammer. On closer inspection, the police found that they both had blood on them. In Marseille, the police had arrested the Goulds. They searched them and in the handbag of Mrs Marie Gould, they found a large amount of jewellery. It was later identified to have belonged to Mrs Levin. At first, the couple told the police that Mrs Levin had a lover who had killed her in their villa in a jealous rage. They said that they were stunned by what had happened and without thinking properly, they believed that if they told the police, they would be implicated in the crime, so instead decided to dispose of the body. They did this by dismembering it and placing it in the trunk. The police listened to their story but did not believe it and arrested both Mr and Mrs Gould. They charged them with murder. Veer, however, always considered himself to be a gentleman and told the authorities that it was actually himself that had committed the murder and that his wife had had nothing to do with it. He said that he had acted alone. The police were very sceptical of his confession. Their investigation had led them to believe that it was in fact his wife Marie who had arranged the whole thing and that she had encouraged her husband to do away with Mrs Levin. They also wondered if she may have had something to do with the death of her first two husbands. The trial began in Monaco's Palais de Justice in December 1907 and became a press sensation. There was interest from all over the world. Many newspapers ran the headline, the Monte Carlo trunk murder. The case had everything that the press believed would fascinate the public. A dismembered body of a wealthy widow found in a trunk, the accused being a previous tennis champion and Wimbledon finalist, along with his wife, who dreamed of a high society life, but had never had the means to obtain it. Veer St Ledger Gould again tried to take full responsibility something his wife seemed happy for him to do, but the court and the press would have none of it. Marie often sobbed during the trial and her behaviour throughout seemed quite exaggerated, seemingly overcome on occasions and almost fainting. It was apparent that the public and the press believed that she was the mastermind behind the whole event, coming to Monte Carlo in an attempt to win a fortune, borrowing money from Mrs Levin and then doing away with her and stealing her jewellery. The trial was a short affair and both Mr Veer St Ledger Gould and his wife were found guilty. However, in a very strange turn of events, the court decided that Marie was in fact more guilty, having believed that she had planned the crime and while her husband was sentenced to life in prison, she was to be executed by the guillotine. This was strange as the Monaco government did not actually possess either a guillotine or an executioner and not wanting to execute a woman, her sentence was later commuted to life in prison. Veer was sent to Devil's Island in French Guiana. The 1879 Wimbledon finalist, who came from a well-respected family, was to live out his life in a prison on a rocky island in the North Atlantic Ocean, a prison that had been established by Emperor Napoleon's government in 1852. He was, however, only there for a short period as his health deteriorated and on the 8th of September 1909, he took his own life. He was 55 years old. Marie was sent to Montpellier prison, where in 1914, 
she caught typhoid fever and died. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As you know, I really value all your comments and feedback, so please leave any that you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case 